Welcome to First Congregational Church in Guilford, Connecticut, where we say whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. This morning, as we take a few minutes to prepare ourselves for worship, I invite you to take a deep breath in and to breathe out. Breathe in the breath of God and breathe out the love of God. Roll our shoulders back and open our hands and our hearts and our minds. And let us prepare for worship by hearing these words from the Gospel of Matthew. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by a boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. And when Jesus landed, he saw a large crowd. He had compassion on them and he healed the sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We only have five loaves and two of bread and two fish here, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And Jesus directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking up the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of people who ate were more than 5,000 adults and children. May God grant us wisdom and understanding to this passage. <clears throat> If the Gospels had a top 40 greatest hits list, the feeding of the 5,000 would certainly rank high on that list. Chances are you are familiar with this story. This and so this morning, I'm not going to try to wring any new theological meaning out of this particular story, but rather I would like to walk us through it together to see what it might teach us about stewardship, generosity, and how that might be important for us in our, the lives that we are living together. The story opens with Jesus on a boat. He had just heard of the death of his friend and first cousin, John the Baptist, and so he needs some time to grieve. He wants to retreat from the demands of ministry, and even though he is far off the beaten path, the crowds still find him. And so Jesus, as he comes in on the boat back from his retreat, one would think that he would have no interest in seeing the crowds, that he is tired, he is sad. And so the scriptures make a point of saying that Jesus had compassion on them. He heals the sick and the wounded. And when it gets late, the disciples recommend a dinner break. Jesus directs the disciples to feed the crowd. So here in this opening snapshot, we learn two things. First of all, grieving people are important to our community. They can contribute, they, even, even if they are contributing with limited capacity. Jesus is devastated when John the Baptist gets executed by the Roman governor. I imagine the very last thing he wants to do is treat people in a large, hang out in a large crowd with strangers. And yet Jesus is moved to compassion and, it, and in his undoubtedly exhausted state, he does what he can do to help. The second thing we learn in this opening snapshot is that it is important to attend to both acute and basic needs. Jesus heals the sick and the wounded, the acute needs, but he also makes sure that no one else, that no one is hungry. Church is a place where we invite everyone to contribute and participate as they can. Even when we feel limited by grief, stress, time, or resources, there is an opportunity to serve and to be appreciated. 
Church is a place where we come alongside each other in crisis, yes. But church is also a place where we build ongoing relationships and give support in ordinary times as well. The story then continues with Jesus having just told the disciples, you feed them. And now there's this expression of scarcity. The disciples don't have the food or the money to feed a crowd that size. Just, just imagine with me for a moment what their faces looked like when Jesus says, you feed them. In their slack-jawed, wide-eyed shock, they seem to have forgotten that Jesus is the one that makes impossible things somehow possible. The disciples offer up what they have, a meager two loaves of bread, five loaves of bread, and two fish. What posture do you think the disciples took in their bodies when they were bringing Jesus these loaves and fishes? Are they apologetic? Ashamed that they couldn't do better? Are they dismissive or skeptical that just this snack would feed 5,000 people? Maybe one disciple is, is curious as to what Jesus will do. Maybe another one was really craving a tuna sandwich and is upset he has to now share. Church is a place where the gift you bring is enough. There are a lot of feelings that come up about money and giving. Perhaps you feel insufficient or that you could never give enough to make a real impact. Just like in this gospel story, any gift given in faith is enough. Any gift given in hope will make a difference. So next in this story is where theological interpretation kind of divides. Generally, there are two camps of thought when reading the story of the feeding of the 5,000. The first camp is, says that when Jesus takes, blesses, breaks, and gives these loaves and fishes, a practical, physical miracle occurs. The fish continue to produce fillets, and the bread never runs out. They are multiplied in the miracle of Christ. The second camp that interprets this passage is that when Jesus brings forth this meager offering, the humility of the great teacher and his generosity to share what he had amongst the disciples sparks a chain reaction of generosity throughout the crowd, with everyone looking at the example of Jesus, forgetting about their own scarcity and digging into their picnic baskets to share and share and share and share until everyone is fed, until there is more than enough. This is the sociological miracle and a metaphysical, metaphorical, metaphorical multiplication of the bread and the fish. What do you think happened? What interpretation do you feel drawn to this morning? I find myself frequently moving between two camps. Some days I need a Jesus who can do the practical, real, physical miracle. Some days I need the Jesus who could affect human behavior. Regardless of how you see this moment of multiplication, both interpretations are examples of how faith overcomes fear. It is a real risk to share. Our minds are flooded with questions like, what if someone takes advantage of me? What if I am the only one who shares? What if I share and then I don't have enough for me? What if no one else contributes even though they clearly have more resources? What if someone judges the snacks that I have and doesn't actually want them? With Jesus at the center of this project, again, all gifts are welcome. It is an act of faith to push past our fears of scarcity, judgment, and fairness. It is an act of faith to uncomplicate our sharing. Church is a place where we exercise and practice this faith together. And so this story ends with a report of the abundance that was produced that day. Verse 20 reads, Everyone ate until they were full. They filled 12 baskets with leftovers. And I love how this story moves from Jesus' personal feelings of depletion and grief 
into this abundance at the end. We go from grief and needing to retreat to recharge to abundance. And more than wife, more than once I've seen my life take a very similar rhythm to come across a situation where my first impression is, I don't think I can do this. And finding myself moved to conviction and compassion and wondering, how will this work? And then finishing with reflecting back on that situation and being grateful for what God has done, what miracles have occurred. This morning, as much as I love a tuna fish sandwich, First Church does not need your sandwiches. We don't need your loaves and fishes. What we're asking for is commitments of your time, talent, and treasure. This community does so much good, both locally and beyond. I've only been here a month, and I can already tell how much is going on and how the ripples are spreading. There is wisdom to being bold when others are being timid. It takes significant amounts of resources to do the work that we've continued to do. We have the means to be generous even in this time of economic anxiety. For those of us who have time to volunteer, I ask that you consider ways in which you can donate your time and your talent in those ways. For those of us who have the financial means to share just a little bit more, know that those gifts will be multiplied beyond what we could even we could do as individuals. And following the example of Jesus, the church will take our gifts, bless them, break them into categories and give them away into the support of people and programs. People like Rachel and Clara are interns. Programs like refugee resettlement. People like the young adults of the Pilgrim Fellowship, program like the Environmental Ministry Team, people who are homebound or grieving, programs like Sunday School. We are faithful stewards of what we've been given. We are a community of abundant generosity. Thank you for sharing what you can. Thank you for joining in the blessing. Amen.